So the topic of today's presentation is hybrid rapid arc for stage three lung cancer. During this time is review some of the technical challenges associated with stage three lung cancer treatment planning. And we'll the application of one approach that we've taken to this these group of patients called hybrid rapid arc. And then finally a comparison with this hybrid rapid arc technique to some other commonly used planning techniques for these groups of patients. As Spencer mentioned, this uh, talk is sponsored by Varian, uh, so I just wanted to disclose that information and as well an statement from Varian. Okay, stage 3 lung cancer. Now, most of the time when there's a talk about lung cancer treatment planning these days, it's, it's all about SBRT for the early stage stuff, but I think there's a lot of challenges that we have when we look at uh, the later stage layers. and uh, particularly some of them come up are the variation that we see in target size and location. If we think of something like prostate, we have, sure there's variation from patient to patient, but for the most part, the size is similar, the location with respect to critical structures is similar, and it makes it fairly straightforward for us to come up with a robust template for approaching these types of patients. That's not so much the case with late stage lung cancer. The tumor may be left, right, uh, upper, lower lobe, lots of size variation, and then depending on the extent of involved lymph nodes in the mediastinum, we can have a lot of challenges with trying to come up with a standard way of approaching these patients from a treatment planning perspective. Respiratory motion is also an issue, and although this talk is not going to focus on respiratory management, uh, in terms of gating, like we're, we're assuming that uh, patients will be treated in an ungated setting, which I think is is uh, what most people are doing. Sorry, I'll speak a little louder here. There's been a few comments about that. Uh, one aspect to respiratory motion is how some of the decisions we make in planning may affect the accuracy of dose delivery when you're ungated. And finally, organic always a challenge, and I think there's some some unique things that we look at with respect to uh, stage 3 lung cancer. Okay, so here's an app section from uh, a typical patient. Uh, we've got the, the GTV contoured here in orange, and there's also some involved lymph nodes here as well. Uh, there may or may not be a CTV depending on your protocol. And finally, we're going to have a TV that's going to include uh, all of the most target as well as our daily setup uncertainty. Now, depending on regimen, uh, these patients will typically receive a radical dose of anywhere from 60 to, you know, the low 70s of gray with a conventional 2 gray dose per fraction. We're using 6 and 33 in our center. So, depending on the low, we may be very close to the cord, similar to this situation, where we're going to be wanting to limit the, the higher doses, around 45 to 50 gray, to the, uh, keep them away from the cord. Uh, we may have the heart in close proximity where we're looking at more of the mid-dose range. Typically, V40 is something that's looked at with heart, for example. And then finally, we've got the whole thing surrounded by otherwise healthy lung. And there's growing clinical evidence that irradiating large amounts of lung with low dose is something that we need to be very concerned about. So when you take a look, I and mean, this is no easy uh, uh, presentation here that we're left to deal with. So how can we it? Well, we often turn to IMRT these days when we're presented with a, a difficult clinical situation. And there are some nuances that we need to be careful with with IMRT for lung cancer. Now, there was a series of articles in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2012 that looked at evidence for the use of IMRT in various disease sites. And one of those papers focused on lung, and that's uh, what I've got referenced here. Specifically, they looked at this group of patients receiving these radical doses of around 66 and 33. They came up with criteria, what defined good clinical evidence to support the use of IMRT. And then they went out and surveyed the literature for such evidence. They came back with only two papers that met those criteria. And of those two papers, they both were from the same cancer center with a bit of overlap in the patient population. So you could argue there was maybe only one data set that actually showed some evidence for the use of IMRT. But, but there, there were other papers, though, that showed 
some potential benefits to IMRT. So all is, all is not lost here. But I did want to quote a couple of the important conclusions from that uh, retrospective review. He said, studies reached virtually identical conclusions that there seems to be a benefit to IMRT in terms of its sparing of normal tissues, at least in terms of sparing them from higher dose, but there is a need to monitor the effects of the lower dose spillage. I mean, that, that applies to most IMRT, but in particular, this notion of monitoring the effect of the lower dose spillage is something that's a bit unique to lung. But they also said that given the, the problems with lung IMRT, including target definition, target motion, and the potential toxicity of low dose radiotherapy to large amounts of lung, it would not be appropriate to advocate for the full implementation of IMRT for lung radiotherapy without some regard to its potential limitations. And this is pretty recent stuff here that we're talking about, okay? Now, uh, target definition, uh, that, that's a big issue. It's really a talk unto itself. A lot of us will use uh, multimodality imaging to introduce functional aspects to our target definition. Uh, for example, um, PET. Oh, so I wanted to uh, a little note here from Spencer. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end of the talk, uh, but please feel free to submit questions as you go, and we'll try to get through as many as we can while we're still online. Now, I'm also going to leave contact information at the end of the talk, and please feel free to send me an email after if you have more questions. Okay, back to um, what I'm going to focus on here mainly is is target motion, and again, not not gating and motion control, but when we treat ungated, what sort of things do we need to be aware of in our planning process to make sure that uh, we can deliver dose accurately? And secondly, I'm going to talk about the effect of low dose radiotherapy to large amounts of lung. Okay, start with the lung toxicity issues. Um, there's a very interesting paper from Aaron Allen in 2006, it was rapidly communicated to the Red Journal. What they did is they switched over their technique from 3D conformal to IMRT for the treatment of mesotheliomia, which is a, a cancer of the inner lining of the lung. And what they found was that 16 patients treated with IMRT developed fatal pneumonitis after the treatment. And it really caused them to stop and reflect on what had changed with IMRT. You know, things are supposed to get better with IMRT, not worse, right? Some of their observations were um, that almost the interlateral lung received a very low dose of radiation in their IMRT, and that was not characteristic of what they had seen in their 3D plans. They saw that the volume getting 5 gray in the lung and the mean lung dose were high in the IMRT patients. And they started thinking about whether this concept of maybe the amount of lung spared completely from the beam uh, would be an important predictive factor for lung toxicity. Now there's been other papers in the meantime that have been looking at this effect. Uh, here's another one from the Red Journal where they're plotting the incidence of pulmonary complications as a function of the lung volume exposed to more than 5 gray. And you can see this relationship where as this volume increases, the toxicity increases. And there's almost a, a thresholding somewhere in the range of 60 to 70 gray where this starts to take off a little. Here uh, from the MD Anderson where they were looking at a similar effect. Here they're plotting the freedom from grade 3 treatment related pneumonitis as a function from of the uh, start of radiation. So these are all IMRT patients also. So what they found was when they looked at their, uh, their plans retrospectively, the patients whose V5 for the lung was less than or equal to 70% were free from treatment-related pneumonitis. However, those who had a V5 greater than 70%, about 25% of them developed grade 3 pneumonitis. So again, this consistency with something going on with the low dose uh, to lung. So why are we talking about this all of a sudden with, uh, uh, in the context of IMRT? Well, let's look back to how we might approach a plan from a 3D planning perspective. So, uh, here's that same that, that I presented earlier, and there's a number of ways we could, but typically we would restrict our beams to some kind of an ant and post arrangement, and then we need to add a third or fourth field to get off cord because we're going to be going up above 60 gray, right? 
So for PTV and Magenta, we have 95% of our prescription dose covering the target fairly well. And what we probably didn't turn on was those really low isodose lines, like 500 centigrade. But when we do, we can see how we were avoiding a large sector contralateral lung uh, from the beam in this type of field arrangement. Now, for IMRT or rapid arc approach, normally when we start with a fixed beam IMRT approach, we do something that's very sensible. We put on equal spaced beams as our default beam arrangement. Why? Because it gives the optimization the most flexibility to optimize dose in the patient. When you do this, like lung, you end up getting a very nice conformality of the dose to our target. However, we end up spilling low dose almost throughout the entire thorax. And here, if we look at the five gray line for a typical plan, you can see that on the slices where there is tumor, almost the entire thorax is getting five gray. And then because of our beam penumbra and scatter out of the field, this extends about you know, anywhere from three to five centimeters superior and inferiorly to the target. So we end up with this large bath of, of low dose here to the lung. The rule of thumb that I use is, and keep in mind, less than 10% of the prescription dose. So essentially, what the beam sees in the beam's eye view, that volume is going to get five gray. A paper out of MD Anderson where they were, they were doing, uh, taking a look at rapid arc for these patients, similar to what, what I showed on the last slide. They're conforming dose well to the target, but when you turn on that low dose line, it's, it's uh, spilling all over the place. So what can we do about this? Well, there's a strategies that come to mind right away. I mean, first of all, we could reduce the fields that we're using, right? That's a sensible thing and similar to what we would have done with, uh, with a 3D planning approach. Uh, alternatively, we may want to use inverse planning. Uh, we, we've all worked in spaces where uh, you can just ask the computer what, what you would like and have it go off and um, come up with an optimized plan. Why not put a lot of priority on trying to minimize the low dose to the lung and see what the computer can come up with? Or maybe we could use a common of these. Who knows? OK, well, uh, here's a paper that was looking at uh, trying optimization to control the low dose to the lung. So they started off with a nine-field equal-spaced beam arrangement, and they put a lot of priority on trying to uh, reduce the V10 and the V20 to the lung. And uh, this is a, one example of a dose distribution. So keep in mind, you've got nine fields coming all the way around the patient here. We see that the optimization has constrained dose mainly to the ipso lung, and it's effectively pretty much shut off the beam from the contra -lide. And it's been able to get pretty good conformality to the target here at the same time. Now, when they looked at their population of patients that they studied, they saw that although they were able to get V10 and V20 for the lung, similar between 3D and IMRT, they still higher V5 in the IMRT than what was observed in their 3D planning. You know, slightly higher. However, uh, also that the number of monitor units required total for all the beams, in order to deliver gray fraction increased a lot, almost sevenfold between 3D and IMRT. And what's going on here is the number of MUs you're seeing in an IMRT plan is a good surrogate for the complexity of the modulation that's going on in each field. So the, the higher number of monitor units, the more of a modulation factor you have in each field. And this is important because this leads into this uh, second effect that I want to talk about, which is motion interplay. So what is, uh, when we're in planning and we uh, use IMRT to come up with uh, a modulated fluence for each beam, the linear accelerator realizes that fluence in reality by a series of uh, MLC motions and dynamic dose rate control. But from the perspective of the treatment planning computer, the patient is static in terms of its dose calculation. But what in reality, when we deliver these treatments to the patient, is that while the MLC is moving, the tumor is actually moving under respiration. 
So what happens is the interplay of this dynamic delivery by the NLC and the dynamic motion of the target creates in, um, errors in the distribution. I shouldn't say errors. It's basically a, a difference from the dose distribution that the treatment planning system is showing you. And this, this uh, interaction between the two is commonly referred to as motion interplay. There's a really nice paper out of the Harvard Medical School that looked at this effect in great detail for the exact group of patients that we're talking about today. What they did is they took a, a patient 40 CT scan that they had and they created a patient model out of that data. So the surface contour was based on that patient. They even went to the detail of ex creating a tumor model from that same patient and extracting that patient's breathing trace and the motion from 40 CT in order to simulate that motion in their phantom. And then they used a control system here to, to actually realize that in practice. Then what they did is they loaded up this tumor with 20 micro decimeters. And they carried an entire course of fractionated radiotherapy to this phantom and accumulated dose in the dosimeters and compared the dose after each fraction to the dose that the treatment planning computer thought had accumulated to that point in the treatment. Then they did this for a number of different treatment planning techniques to see what the infra treatment planning technique was on the ability of us to deliver dose accurately in the tumor. Okay. Uh, we're going to walk through some of the results here uh, slowly. So what we've got on the vertical axis here is the probability that 95% of points are within 2%. So that's in comparing the dose measured in the tumor in the tumor model to the dose and planning computer had calculated to that point in treatment. And this is a function of the number of fractions. Remember, we're accumulating dose in the entire treatment. So the, the, all the fractions are delivered um, with, a, with a dose measurement at the end of each fraction. So ideally, what we would see is that at the first fraction, whoa, uh, 100 of our points would be within 2%. Okay, so we'd have good agreement between the dose that was delivered and the dose that the treatment planning computer saw. And hopefully the graph would look a little better than what I drew. And anyway, then it would be the same over the entire course of the we accumulated dose exactly like the treatment planning system told us it would. But of course, what we get is not that good in reality. What we see is that this curve gets shifted to the right. And we see in the initial delivery, the first few fractions, because of the interplay, the dose accuracy from the treatment planning system is not that good. There's a lot of a scalloping of the dose distribution produced by that motion. However, the degree of the interplay is very dependent on which technique you use to plan. Okay, So if we break this down a little bit, we see this first grouping of curves here contains a typical 3D conformal plan with a low number of monitors. So you can see that by after about five fractions, the effect of the interplay has effectively blurred out or washed out because you're going to be starting these treatments randomly every day. And that's the tendency that you do see is that the, the longer course of treatment that you have, the more opportunity these effects have to blur out in your tumor. And eventually, you will reach a point where the delivered dose is in very good agreement with what the treatment planning computer calculated. Okay. Now if we switch to an IMRT approach, and we keep it simple, fairly low module, the MUs are not that much higher than a 3D conformal, we see the very same characteristics of the 3D conformal plan. But as we start to drive up the complexity of our IMRT plan, the effect of the interplay becomes more significant, and it takes longer for us to be able to see these effects wash out over the course of a patient treatment. And this can be very uh, attempting to do as a dosimetrist because this is what I call the tweaking phase. Tight tail, maybe we're trying to push a little more dose out of the uh, out of the critical structures. What's going on is that process can drive up the complexity without us knowing it, or at least we're readily displayed to us. 
Now, also I wanted to point back to that paper where they had used nine equispaced beams and allowed the computer to do They were getting MUs almost 2,000. I mean, I wonder where that would sit on this chart here. Now, ARCs also, uh, were also studied in this paper, and they are certainly not immune to this effect either. If anything, they're more. If we look at a single ARC with just a simple plan, it falls in the range that's similar to the complex IMRT plan. And then as I have up the complexity of the ARC plan, this gets even worse. For this example that they had in their study, we actually never reached good agreement uh, between the measured dose and the calculated dose over the course of the entire 33 fraction treatment. Okay, so interplan significant for this patient. Now one good rule of thumb that you can do with ARCs is uh, a very effective way to mitigate some of these motion interplay problems is to take a single ARC and switch it to a dual ARC. So we've got the same level of complexity, but delivered as two arcs. And we see uh, interplay that's very similar to a 3D conformal plan. OK? So uh, it's a good thing to keep in mind. OK, so let's and see where we're at at this point. Uh, if we compare 3D conformal and IMRT for stage 3 lung cancer, if we look at the high dose TV, I'm going to give 3D conformal a poor. It's able to deliver a good uniform dose to the target, but in terms of the conformality, it's usually not that great. IMRT can deliver a fairly uniform dose, and we can usually achieve good conformality of that dose distribution to the target. How about low dose? Well, traditionally, 3D conformal has been very good at that, uh, largely because of our, of our limited number of fields and the way we've chosen those field angles. Uh, IMRT and arc. Well, poor, certainly if you're using a full arc or if you're using equispaced beams. Motion interplay, uh, we've seen with 3D conformal that that's a fairly low effect because in that case, we're using either open fields that are wide enough to encompass the motion of the target, or we have lightly modulated fields with things like wedges in the beam. IMR rapid arc, I rate this as a medium to high effect. And I think largely what I mean to say is you got to be careful about how you're doing your IMRT here uh, when you're when you're um, looking at interplan. It's very sensitive. Okay, so what if we could extract the best of both of these? And I think that's where some of these hybrid techniques really shine. So what is it, IMRT or rapid arc? Uh, it's a technique that was an intro initially introduced for breast by uh, Charles Mayo when he was at the University of Massachusetts. And what we do is deliver the majority of the prescribed dose per fraction by uh, just static open fields. And we'll call this component the base dose. And then the remainder of the dose per fraction is, is topped up with some IMRT or rapid arc. And if um, a field-in-field -field breast tangent plan this is exactly what hybrid IMRT is. There we would deliver about 8% of the dose with just straight up open fields. And then we would deliver the remaining 20% with some segments in order to polish the dose distribution and make it uniform. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Now, because some of the challenges we face in breast, in other words, needing a limited uh, arrangement of beams and having issues like motion to deal with, um, the issues are very similar to what we might see in lung and esophagus, and they, and they ported some of these ideas over uh, to that disease site. OK, so let's look for, uh, for a lung case. So here we've got it in the thorax. And uh, what, what we, uh, when we define the base dose, we deliver 120 of the 200 centigrade with static open fields, just an ant post, parallel opposed pair. And all we do is we snap our MLC to the PTV with a margin for penumbra, and that's it. Okay, just get the basic dose into the target. And then we polish uh, the rest of the dose distribution, the additional 80 centigrade that's required, with a restricted partial arc. So this is our, our portion coming off the cord, and we're trying to air some of the lung at the same time. Okay, so this is typically how that dose would be distributed by the optimization. And then we deliver all of these fields every day, and we get uh, the combination giving a dose distribution like this. And if I put it on a, 
on a nice hills plot here, we can see here's our target again, our PTV and magenta. Is 95% of our prescription dose, which we've conformed pretty well to the target. We've been able to pull the 50 gray isodose line away from the canal or the spinal cord. See that here? And we've also been able to get some sparing of the contralateral lung here by placing some restrictions on our arc trajectory. Okay? So why does hybrid work well for lung? Well, I think it gives better control of the low and intermediate doses because we've put some constraints on our field arrangements and we haven't allowed arcs to go all the way around the patient, for example. And it also uses some of the motion-related interplay effects. Because remember, we deliver 60% of the dose per fraction with just a straight open field where the effects of interplay are very minimal. So even if interplay might be creating some issues for the rapid arc component, that component is only delivering 40% of the dose per fraction. So the overall effect of that interplay is lessened. And I think there's a ground between conventional non-IMRT and full-blown IMRT for lung. OK, so now I'm going to walk through some details of our planning process at the Simcoe Muskoka Regional Cancer Center and show you some of that. OK, so uh, most patients also receive a, a PET study as a part of their staging. Um, but our planning is done on the basis of a 4D CT. And all of the, four, the 10 phases of the 4D are sent over to Eclipse. And we use Eclipse's uh, 4D planning tools for contouring. So here, the physicians contour the extent of the motion of the GTV. And that's the orange column here. Then we had a margin around that for CTV. And then we're left with an additional margin for PTV, which is just taking care of the day-to-day -day setup variation. OK, and then same thing for the nodes uh, that are involved in treatment. And we get this PTV. Now, as we scroll up through the distribution, uh, through the, the thorax, one characteristic you see in these volumes is that they can be very long, depending on the amount of mediastinum involved. And this is what creates all of our problems for trying to control D5. Because remember, what the beam sees, the patient gets. So unless the volume is a little shorter, it can be hard to control that. Now here's a dose color wash for a typical hybrid plan. And you can see as you move down how the beam where it's coming in will vary depending on what the tumor looks like in that plane. So it allows, doing this with an arc allows some flexibility to move that off-cord dose around depending on how our tumor is situated in the thorax. OK. Uh, sorry, here, just a minute. OK. The base plan. In Eclipse, we have to create this as a separate plan. And this uh, uh, basic ant and post, parallel opposed pair, sometimes will tilt that off zero by about 10 to 20 degrees, depending on the location of some of the critical structures. But nine times out of 10, a straight uh, ant and post field. We use 18 empically because we're trying to get as much dose into the target as we can and leaving some room on the cord uh, for the, the scatter dose that it's going to get in the rapid arc component. The prescription is 60% of the dose per fraction is prescribed to mid-plane in the center of the field. And then we don't fuss with this plan at all, really for target coverage or uniformity or anything like that. Uh, but we need to make sure that we leave some for the OARs uh, in terms of the additional dose that they're going to get from the rapid arc. OK, now that portion is trying to uh, achieve two goals simultaneously. We want to bring dose off the cord, and at the same time, we want to minimize the volume getting five gray for the lung. Now, these two are usually in direct conflict with each other, right? As a planner, if you want to get dose off the cord, what do you do? You bring in beams laterally, right? But in doing this, we're going to start exiting dose into the contralateral lung, and that's going to shoot the V5 up, right? So what we've done is we've put some restrictions on uh, the, the arc itself. So we restrict the arc trajectory, and that, uh, that was taken from a paper out of the Netherlands. And I'll, I'll show you the details of that in a minute. And then the additional thing that we've done is we've added a lateral avoidance sector to try to prevent beam from exiting through the contralateral lung as much as possible. 
So really what we're trying to do is create a, a range of allowable gantry angles that would be similar to what a dosimetrist might choose for those off-cord beams, but allow some automation of where to put beam within that range by the computer. Okay, so here, here's what portion looks like. The beam is allowed to be on for 60 degrees, and note that this is a right-sided tumor here. And then we have this lateral avoidance sector where the beam is shut off for 60 degrees. And then the beam is allowed to come back on for 90 degrees. So we'll cross over midline by about 30 degrees in this arrangement. And then at the tumor side, well, we just flip this template around uh, the other Here's what it looks in Eclipse. So uh, the reason we have that base plan separate is so that we can use the base dose plan option in the Eclipse op optimization. So what it does is it says, give me the dose from those ant and post fields and assume that that's there as a baseline. And any optimization I need to achieve my overall objectives will be done on top of the dose from those plans, uh, from those fields. Excuse me. Then we have our avoidance sector here, in this case a 60 degree avoidance sector that was needed. And finally the objective of planning are, are pretty straightforward. Really all we need to do is to get dose off the cord. So we've got some upper objectives to try to limit the dose to the cord. And we don't need to put anything in the lung because the, the lung dose is very much determined by the geometry, right? what the beam sees, what, this, what the patient gets. So really, it's the, the allowable gantry angles have predefined uh, V5, essentially. When we optimize TV, we add a little margin. And those of you that use Eclipse will see, know that this is a very helpful thing to help improve coverage around the edges of your target. Okay, And then the only other thing to use is the normal tissue optimization to just try to squeeze dose around the target as much as possible and uh, get reasonable conformality. But we just have a standard set of parameters that we use for all patients. Uh, let's walk through a couple of examples. Here we have uh, a, a patient with a fairly large right-sided tumor. If I was to do this 3D conformal, it would be a very classic style of beam arrangement. An ant and a post, and a post oblique to get off cord, right? It's right out of the textbook. You get um, a nice conformal, well, reasonably conformal distribution and good sparing of the contralateral lung. Put this through the hybrid template, and what do you get? Well, something that, frankly, doesn't look that much different. The conformality is slightly better, but not much. And the sparing of the contralateral lung is similar. You know, dose is coming off the cord in a similar way. So you might be asking, well, what's, what's the point? What benefit are we really getting here out of this technique? Well, let's do another example. Here we've got a, a target that's a little bit more posterior and close to the cord. When we walk, start walking through our iterations of defining a good beam arrangement, we can see, well, three field in order to get off cord, my conformality is not so good. As I start bringing in a fourth field, I need to worry about exiting through the other lung and into the cord. And the point is, there's going to be some iteration until you get to a good solution. With hybrid rapid arc, the planning time was the same as the last case. We put our template on with our ant and post and our partial arc. And we get a good solution. Uh, conformality is pretty good. Dose is off the cord. Contralateral lung is spared. OK? Now, start me uh, clinically in January. We've done about uh, 16 or 17 patients thus far. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of the data from the first five cases that we treated. So uh, in terms of the target, the, the volume getting 95% of the dose, we had initially hoped this would be better than 95%. On average, it's been 99, with a range of 98 to 100. The volume getting 5% of the dose, we wanted to keep that less than 5%. On average, it's been 1, with a range of 0 to 3. So essentially, what we've seen is that the uniformity of dose in the target is about 95 to 105%. Okay. As for V5, we wanted to keep that less than 60%. We've seen an average of 51 in those plans with a range of 44 to 60. V20, less than 30%. Uh, we've seen an average of 28 with a range of 24 to 32. And finally, the mean lung dose, we wanted to keep that less than 20, and the average has been 18. OK. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, uh, finally, I wanted to just do a comparative hybrid to other techniques. And 
you know, this is always a difficult thing to do, right? And I, I find that in a lot of papers where you see comparisons of one technique to another, it's hard to take some of the subjectivity out of those experiments. Uh, you guys know better than anyone else that there's a bit of art to IMRT, right? And when I say I did a plan on IMRT, that might be different than how my colleague uh, did a plan on IMRT, and we might get a very different result as a, re uh, as a result of that. And particularly when you're talking about late stage lung cancer and all of the variation in target size and location, you can guarantee there's going to be variation in what an IMRT plan looks like. So the way I approached it was to uh, solicit some help from three other Canadian cancer centers in how they might approach a problem like this. So I took uh, the centers that were involved. Two of them were, were also, uh, like our site, full Varian. So they were using Eclipse, Varian, Linux. And then one site uh, was a pinnacle site with Alexa Linux. Uh, same data and same contour. So I took one of the very challenging cases that we had and uh, sent the data and the contours and nothing else, no information about how we might have planned this, and just said, plan according to your technique for 66 gray and 33 fractions. Now, we were all using uh, the same dose constraints, though, on our targets, but it was more of the technique. How would you approach this case? Center A approached it with uh, IMRT, a sliding window fixed beam IMRT technique. They use 6MV, three fields, and uh, quite a clever field arrangement here, actually. They had uh, a couple of posterior oblique and an anterior oblique that was able to get some nice conformality to the target, although it's, it's, it's a bit misleading. You can see some high doses squirting out the backside here, too. Uh, all the field planar. The MUs were 634. So that's nice, right? Thinking back to our interplay, that's only about twice the MUs you might see in a 3D conformal plan. So the effect of interplay be uh, fairly small in this instance. Planning time is a bit long for this case, 10 hours. And in speaking with the person who did this plan, what they said is the majority of that time is spent trying to find the right beam angles. It's usually uh, an attempt at some beam angles. Then you roll the dice with the inverse planning and see what the computer comes back with. And if the constraints aren't met, then you need to figure out another beam arrangement. So that was their experience with, uh, with IMRT planning. Cindy used a 3D conformal approach. Uh, they had the luxury of a 10 MV beam, which is a really nice intermediate energy for lung. And they took a, a, a very standard approach to this. Uh, they had an uh, Anton post field with the, the, the classic posterior uh, oblique beam to get off cord, and then um, the conformality was probably not that great, so they added a fourth field in a very nice direction here to get some better conformality and still get some sparing of the uh, contralateral. Four fields, coplanar, MUs, very typical of a two gray fraction for 3D conformal, and a nice planning time, three hours, right? So, you know, let's not, um, uh, 3D can come up with a very, very nice solution for these types of patients. Cindy used an IMRT approach. Here they were using step and shoot. They limited the number of segments to a total of 64. Again, keeping in mind some of those interplay effects. Uh, the beam arrangement was a little bit more complicated. Seven fields. They have a couple of posterior obliques, a couple of anterior obliques. And then they kicked the couch to 90 and brought in a 0, 30, and 330. So sort of a, a soup and an nymph oblique field. Planning about five and a half hours, and, and obviously the treatment delivery time is going to be a bit longer as a result of this approach here. Uh, uh, here we have our, our 18 MV base fields. Here they were kicked off, off of zero slightly uh, in the 6 MV partial arcs. And used about the same as what we saw in the 3D conformal plan, um, and the time was about half an hour. So if we take these plans, some interesting characteristics and similarities between them. Let's take a look at the five gray line, for instance. This is really defined by how we angle our beams and what angles we allow for treatment. And if I scroll plans, you see that it's actually quite similar, especially in terms of how we provide some sparing of the contralateral lung. So that was interesting. Uh, the, the 50 gray line 
which we're trying to push off court, depending on the technique, that gets different directions. And the conformality with only one cut, it's hard to judge that in general. And you might be, be looking at the hybrid plan and thinking this is horrific. Uh, I mean, we did select this case for presentation because it was definitely the worst distribution that we've seen so far. And uh, I think it's important to show that in a, in a presentation. Okay, so the dosimetric uh, parameters for comparison here quickly. Uh, the coverage was similar between them all in terms of the volume getting 95% of the dose. The volume getting 105 uh, was a little bit hotter in the IMRT plans than it was in the hybrid or the 3D conformal. So the uniformity is a little bit better in hybrid and conformal planning. But if we take a look at the con uh, index, which here I've defined as the volume of the 95% isodose line relative to the volume of the PTV. So ideally this would be one. And if it's more than one, it means we're irradiating tissue outside of our target with uh, high dose. You can see that for the IMRT, the conformality is the lowest. It's, it's the best. For the conformal plan, it was quite high, almost two, so the quality was, was not that great. Uh, in the hybrid plan, it sort of falls somewhere in between there, which is between 3D and IMRT, which is somewhat what you would expect because it's a combination of the two, right? The volume getting five gray was best in the hybrid and the non-coplanar IMRT treatment, uh, although it was radically different. The V20 was very similar between all the techniques, and the mean lung dose was also similar. So I think all came up with, with very good plans, and it was interesting to see some of those similarities between the approaches. So some of the options, um, the angles stood by the other centers, for the most part, fell within the partial arc of the hybrid rapid arc. And this was very reassuring for us because this was how we intended the arc to be used, to, to define a range of angles and let the computer optimize how dose was pushed through those beam angles. And if we take a look at uh, the 3D conformal plan from center B and compare it to the hybrid, it's really interesting. So they had an ant and a post field. And in the base fields, we have an ant and a post field, right? And then they added a posterior oblique field at this angle here. And the optimization saw that as it got up past the cord, this was a favorable angle to push dose through. So it did the same thing. And then the, tumor, the GTV uh, of the tumor and the nodes lined up well here in this angle. So the planner decided this would be a good choice to push dose through here. And the optimization saw the same thing. As it comes up through the avoidance sector, it starts sending dose through that angle. So it's, it's like a planner. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, Hybrid, another observation, the planning time was the lowest. And it's very consistent from plan to plan. Uh, the conformity of the pet arc was better than 3D, but worse than IMRT. Okay? And that, the one I showed you was the worst that we've seen thus far. So, a hybrid rapid arc technique can mitigate some of the potential issues associated with low dose to the lung by restricting our arc trajectories and motion by delivering the majority with uh, basic open fields. Uh, Eclipse optimizes dose, optimizes the directions for the off cord dose using the restricted partial arc. And this has helped our planning times a lot. And uh, plans are typically less than an hour. I should say they're, they're always less than an hour, typically about 30 minutes or so, though. Hybrid rapid arc has also has facilitated some standardization of st stage 3 lung planning for us, which has been a big benefit uh, to our center. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank some of my, my colleagues at uh, Simcoe Muskoka for their help on this project. And then uh, the people who took some time out of their busy days to help with this, the uh, dosimetric comparison study. Uh, Cancer Care Manitoba in Winnipeg. Credit Valley Hospital in Mississauga and the Odette Cancer Center in Toronto. Uh, so with that, to floor to some questions if we have time. And uh, like I said before, feel free to email me uh, if you have additional questions uh, that we don't get to. Thanks very much. All right, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to write them in the question box. Uh, Kyle, uh, you probably want to go back to about the 1 o'clock time marker. You've got a number of questions already in there. Okay, sure, let's see if I can uh, find that here. Okay. Um, uh, 
any published recommendation for low dose to the lung. Yeah, the, the most common one that we've seen is V5 less than 60 gray. Uh, that's, there's a, a nice paper out of Memorial Sloan Kettering that took a look at uh, the correlation of dosimetric parameters with toxicity. And they found that really we're in the range of um, 5 to 15 gray is, is, a, is a very good uh, parameter to be looking at in terms of predicting uh, toxicity such as radiation pneumonitis. I don't think we have a, uh, a standard that's fully in, in place yet for that low dose. There's certainly nothing in Quantec, for example, regarding V5. Uh, but I, I suspect that as more of this data becomes available, there will be consensus things published. But I expect them to be in the range of V5 less than 60%. Okay, question here. Was the target for the motion interplay planned to an ITV to account for target motion? Uh, yes, they were using a large volume that encompassed uh, the motion of the tumor. And, and if not, that would have been a constant parameter throughout all of the planning techniques. So it, it certainly wouldn't impact the comparison of one technique uh, versus the other. Uh, what is her experience with six or seven beam IMRT for stage three lung cancer versus hybrid IMRT, especially with respect to V5. Uh, well, my experience is zero, actually. We moved from 3D conformal uh, right to hybrid IMRT. We, we did a little bit of investigation into, um, into IMRT and discussed with some of our other colleagues in southern Ontario, and we found that uh, people had similar problems with respect to uh, orient beams and minimizing beam angles, and that they, tend to, they tended to spend a lot of time on that aspect in planning. So we came across this hybrid technique in the literature uh, through uh, Chuck Mayo and that group in the Netherlands, and then we just took that technique and refined it a little and has found, have found it to work very well. Uh, okay, so do you have concerns using 18MV for your static plans in the lung? Yes, you're, you're referring to the buildup that we would see in 18MV. And certainly uh, there are issues that you need to worry about uh, on, that, on that front. Um, if we were using very small fields like IMRT fields for 18MV in lung, we know that the AAA algorithm tends to break down in those situations, so we would not want to do that. Uh, we only use 18MV for very large fields that cover the whole volume. So uh, there's been literature to show that the calculation accuracy of AAA is good in those scenarios. Now, it's good, so it shows us that the dose can be a little bit light in that buildup region. However, keep in mind that this is effectively a blended treatment because we do a little over half with 18 and, a, and just under half with 6MV. So when you zip that all up together, um, the 6MV, particularly coming in from lateral angles, will help boost up the dose in the buildup region that was missed uh, from the ant and post 18MV field. So we find that it, it's a good combo. Now sometimes we actually put some 6MV into the base field. If you have a really small tumor that's in lung, uh, the buildup can be quite significant to the fact that you can't, to the point where you really can't dose into the target with 18MV. So in those situations, we would put um, either all or some of the base fields using 6MV. Uh, okay, oh, there's a few more questions about buildup there. Um, do you have that the V5 would be for a VMAT plan by itself on the example that you used? Also, I do. I don't have it on the top of, uh, top of my head, though. Uh, the VMAT the, the V5 for the VMAT plan alone that we showed was on the order of about 80 to 85 percent, somewhere in that range. And what happens is with VMAT, of course, if it's unrestricted, you're pretty much going to get five gray on any slice where there is beam. So what becomes the defining parameter there is how long your volume is in the supinth direction. And this is actually been starting to work on. If you look a few slides further in the presentation, we're seeing that, I'll uh, just sort of flip it up to get this to you here, actually. You're seeing that in some situations when the tumor is not 
uh, very long in the soup inf direct, I shouldn't say too many nodes really, you can get away with removing some of that avoidance sector and using a less restricted arc. Now the benefit of this is you improve conformality. So here's a patient with an avoidance sector versus without the avoidance sector, which is not quite a full arc, but it's getting close to a, uh, a full arc. And what you can see is that the conformality gets a lot better, um, but V5 will get higher. So you got to be careful about when you can do this, but uh, this is something that we've, we've been investigating um, uh, further. Okay, um, uh, let's see, where were we here? Um, 18MV, oh boy, uh, this is great. I'm, I'm glad to see there's a lot of concerns about 18MV in lung, because I think people who are using full IMRT for 18MV in, in lung should be very careful about what the treatment planning computer is showing showing them. So I'm glad to see that uh, the dosimetrists are, are, are taking that very seriously. That's great. Okay, um, do you use cone beam CT daily? Yes, we do. We do um, a daily cone beam CT with a bony in alignment initially, and then we turn on the contour of, of the PTV and make sure that our targets are within that on a daily basis. Uh, okay, why why not constrain the contralateral lung? Yes, good question. So why this gets along the line of why not put some optimization, um, sorry, put some objectives in the inverse planning on the contralateral lung to try to drive things away. You know, we've tried this, and I'm not sure if there's some tricks or, uh, that you can do or if there's something to do with the eclipse optimization. But frankly, we found this hasn't helped much. In fact, I was running uh, plans with full arcs with separate optimization objectives for the contralateral lung, and I had the priority of the contralateral lung set almost 10 times higher uh, than any other parameter in the optimization. And Eclipse just didn't seem to realize that it should shut that beam off from the contralateral side. So I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what's going on in the optimization that's preventing that, uh, but it didn't clever enough to realize that those shouldn't be put in there. And that's really why we've had to introduce the, the sectors, the, the avoidance sector and the restricted arc to help guide that optimization and ensure that Eclipse doesn't put those through those directions. Um, how does bill a hybrid rapid arc? Well, good question. I don't know. We don't have to bill it, so that's a, uh, that's a good one for us. Are you using heterogeneity corrections? Yes, we are. For all plans, we have heterogeneity correction turned on, and you should be uh, careful about that. I think particularly if you're going to go into IMRT and start modulating fluence, um, you should definitely be using heter heterogeneity corrections. Um, OK, about 18 MV, which hopefully have been answered. Um, yes, wow, great questions about 18 MV. Um, are you can yes. Uh, have your plan QA is allowed QA of the ARC plans to offset the planning time? Oh, excellent question. Uh, yes, we do have uh, additional QA time now because we do a phantom QA using Sun Nuclear's ARC check device for all of these plans. And that's an important balance to consider when you're doing this because what we're doing is we're trading off dosimetry time for QA after hours. And I feel comfortable saying this in a crowd of this, but we felt the dosimetry time was more valuable than the QA time. And really what I mean there is we had more resources for QA time after hours. So it was a good shift and a good way to, uh, for us to free up uh, planning time. Uh, you combine, merge the base dose plans and the rapid arc plan for delivery. You do, but there's not a, a really s uh, slick way to do this in the planning system. Um, if you're thinking of when you merge subfields, for example, it's very automated in the system. What we have to do is when we're done this, we have the base dose plan, which is separate from the plan that has the uh, partial arc. And what we do is we copy the base dose fields and paste them into the ARC plan. And then we uh, dose calculation with preset values and just copy the, the values and use from the base dose 
into the current plan and and forward calculate that. So you have to manually copy the fields and put them into uh, the the arc plan so that you end up with all the fields in one plan to deliver every day. Okay. Um, for the APPA plan and rapid arc, was the same isocenter used for these plans? Yes, we do use the same isocenter for these plans. And the way isocenter is chosen is uh, inferior, inferior direction. We try to put it around the center of the PTV. In the AP direction, we try to keep it roughly midline. And in the lateral direction, we try to keep it within four centimeters of of uh, the midline of the patient. And the reason we do that is we try to avoid, uh, well, it's to be mindful of the potential for collisions, uh, but it also helps in that when we comb beam the patient, we don't have to move the patient out of the OBI safe zone, so the couch doesn't have to move. Because if you've, if you've done that on the varying units, you've seen it does that automatic couch motion. It's very jerky at, at the start and stop of motion. So we try to avoid that. Um, as much as possible, and uh, and really the only thing is if your isocenter is not placed very well, then your fields in the rapid arcs get bigger, and if they get too big, then the inlet reach where it needs to when it's um, uh, optimizing, and you can end up with uh, poor conformality and a little bit higher dose to critical structures. So usually, what we have the planners do when they're when they're finished the plan, and I think this is a great practice for all rapid arc is is Turn on the beam's eye view, play the movie of the, of the MLC motion with your target, your PTV on as a structure. And take a look as you rotate around the patient. If you see MLCs that hit their limit at any point, and it looks like they should be closing, but they're all lined up in a straight line, that means your field size is too big. The MLC wants to go there, but it can't because it's restricted. So in that case, it's good to either uh, you know, do some technique to try to reduce your field size. Um, you know, maybe using a dual arc or something like that. How are we doing for time, Spencer? Yeah, as long as you'd like, uh, the attendees are, um, you guys have uh, you know, more than earned your credits. If you want to hang around for the questions, you're welcome to. Uh, if not, uh, we'll see, okay. uh, hopefully we'll see most of you guys tomorrow. Uh, there is a post-webinar okay. survey. If they just want to take a few minutes to answer that when you guys leave, it'll take you all about two minutes, but uh, you're Three to answer any more questions you want, Kyle. Okay. I mean, there's a there's a list here. I'm happy to go through them. I'm just not sure if we're gonna if we're gonna get cut off. Just yell. Oh no, you won't I mean, get I cut off. A little bit of time here. Yeah, no cut off. Okay. Just, so, uh, keep going. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Um, what? Okay. What else do you look at to tolong? or ipsilateral and contralateral lung. Okay, we use um, the total lung minus the PV. And uh, again, there was, a, there was a nice paper out of Memorial Sloan Kettering where they, uh, they looked at a number of dosimetric parameters and tried to correlate them with lung toxicity. And when they looked for statistical significance in, um, in those parameters, in other words, which was the most predictive of lung toxicity. And what they found was that it, it really didn't matter how you were evaluating it, whether you were doing contralateral, ipsilateral, whole lung, that the most predictive factors were in that low dose range of, of sort of 5 to 15 gray in terms of showing the, the most uh, correlation with um, toxicity. So we've been using total lung uh, to the to the comment I mentioned a while back. I guess it would be helpful if we had some consensus guidelines so that everybody would do this the same way and we could build a better database of of, of it. But in the meantime, um, uh, that's what we're stuck with. And and there's there's the RTOG studies on these populations of patients for IMRT are are kind of few and far between. There's a couple of them. And those tend to lead into uh, consensus guidelines for how structures should be contoured. We'll, we'll stay tuned to that and see see what comes from that. Uh, yeah, you know, there's a lot of great comments about 18MV here, and and uh, definitely uh, we recognize that. I think 
uh, also to keep in mind, there's, there's two competing effects going on here. We're treating the mediastinum as well in a lot of these patients. And that's where the patient is thicker. Uh, so when we prescribe to the middle of the field, we tend to get MUs that are uh, giving, we tend to get a dose that's covering that region fairly well. And then when we go off into the lung, where buildup might be a more of a problem in the, in the tumor, um, you, you're already giving more dose in that area in the base fields because there's less density along the path length to the tumor. So there's a little bit of balancing going on with that. Um, it's, you know, if you patient by patient basis to optimize, you probably have a lot of uh, situations where 6MV would be better than 18MV and vice versa. We've tried to template and standardize this as much as possible for speed. And there may be situations where we use some 18MV and we could have got a little bit more dose in around the periphery with 6MV, um, but we just haven't taken the time to look at it during planning, you know, to, to be frank. Uh, yeah, that's it. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is if I look at this patient that we see here, I mean, here's a fairly small isolated tumor. This is, this is not the norm with these patients, right? They usually have a large tumor um, adjacent to other tissue and the effects of buildup aren't quite as, as significant. But again, it also helps to have a large field size, right, so that uh, you're getting some scatter in towards that buildup region as well. Okay, uh, again, AAA uh, with uh, the heterogeneity correction turned on. How uh, much mark you put on the APATA fields? Uh, about a centimeter, standard, yes. Um, were any comparisons done with compensator-based IMRT for motion interplay? Ha, ah, good question. And no, there were none in, in if, Jeez, uh, you know what? You'd have to paper to be sure, but I'm I'm pretty sure there was not any compensator-based delivery in there, and that's an interesting question because a lot of the the interplay that we see here is because of the dynamic component of the MLC-based delivery. You don't have that with compensator-based delivery, right? Even though you've got a fluence, that fluence is in effect static. Once you turn the beam on. If you were to look in a plane underneath the compensator, the dose is what it is while the beam is on, as opposed to the MLC delivery where it's sweeping across the field. So the interplay would definitely be less for the compensator-based IMRT. Um, there was a whole bunch of curves in that paper that I didn't talk about. So if you check that reference, um, it'd be interesting to see what that is. Um, have paired these techniques to proton therapy for stage three. Oh boy, no, uh, we haven't. We uh, we actually don't have any proton therapy facilities in Ontario, uh, so we're we're not able to to do that. Uh, next question: Why not partial arc for the whole treatment? Hey, fantastic question. Uh, we've looked into that. Yes, um, and again, it's it's helping Eclipse out a little bit you would think that the APPA fields are within the range of the fields that you deliver in the restricted arc that they would be unnecessary, right? Why doesn't the system just uh, slow the gantry down when it's delivering and put more dose through those angles because they're favorable? Well, it doesn't do that. Um, and what we find is that the gantry speed uh, is, is fairly constant, even, even when we have just the, the partial arc and no base field. And it's not able, it, it doesn't realize that it should push more of those through those angles. So again, like our restricted arc, we have to help the optimization out a little bit uh, by doing the base fields. But there's also two other big benefits to the base fields, right? And that's the motion interplay mitigation that you get by having the static open field. And I think to go back to the 18MV thing, there is a little benefit here in terms of having that second energy available for the base field because you can you can get a little dose to the cord when you're putting beam through in that APPA geometry. Uh, what, okay, uh, sorry, next question. Um, 
in um, 18 MV. Boy, you know, we're, we're going to have to really reflect on the use of 18 MV because this is very helpful feedback here. Here's another one. Our physicians only use 6 MV on lung cases. Do you have any documentation or data above 6 MV is okay? Uh, yes, we do. Um, there, there are studies that have been done on um, the accuracy of dose calculation in using 18 MV and search was historically a problem because our our dose calculation algorithms prior to 3D superposition were very inaccurate. So the the tendency was to stay away from 18 MV because there's a lot of dose going on that the computer is not showing us. Um, that is still there to some degree, but it's largely limited to the use of small fields with 18 MV in lung. Large so if you were doing your modulation with 18 MV, that would definitely be a concern in terms of how accurate is the dose that's displayed to me. Uh, when we have six, sorry, when we're just using the big open fields for 18 MV, there are some some papers, Columbia, that looked at the accuracy of AAA super um, AAA's algorithm with heterogeneity correction and found that they were actually quite good. So based on that, we are uh, using these techniques. So you got to be careful which algorithm you're using. Um, certainly if you're a useful beam algorithm, um, I would steer away from 18 MV. But if you're in AAA, you know, you can have uh, better confidence in the distribution for large fields. Uh, okay. Um, uh, with these hybrid high dose plans, do you worry about meeting other normal tissue constraints such as heart and esophagus? And if so, how does this affect D5? Good question. Um, yes, we do. Our protocol has constraints for the heart as well as the esophagus. And um, what we found is that uh, the, the times that we've needed to factor in the heart is uh, when we have the heart very anterior to the target. <clears throat> and it's actually not the rapid arc component that is effective for reducing heart dose in those situations. What's more effective is to just tilt the base dose field a little. So those situations where I said sometimes it's advantageous to tilt the, the field 10 to 20 degrees, there's really two situations where we would do that. The first would be if we have the heart sitting directly anterior to the target. Because there, if we put on an APPA and we're delivering 60% or about 40 gray to that volume, well, we've irradiated the entire heart to 40 gray with the base fields alone. So that's not going to work. So you need to tilt the fields a little to remove some of the heart from the base dose fields. The other situation where we would tilt the fields a little is if, depending on how your target is oriented, if you can shrink your field size a little bit by rotating the field slightly, that can reduce your lung dose. Okay. Um, esophagus, yes, we evaluate the esophagus. We use, uh, I think, V40 less than 50% and the mean dose less than 34, if I'm recalling that correctly. Uh, that's typically not a problem for the optimization. But if you can see up on here, these are the kind of things that are being improved if we start lessening our dependence on the avoidance sector. Because as you can see here, if I take the avoidance sector out and I get better conformality, I can reduce some dose to particularly the, the heart. The esophagus is usually wound up very close to the target, so there's, there's really not a lot you can do about the esophagus. It's, I don't know what you get, but the um, uh, but, uh, really target is small enough in the supium direction that we can meet the objectives on the esophagus. We really don't include it in the optimization at all. Uh, we check it at the end, and it hasn't been a problem so far. Okay. Uh, what collimator rotation do you use for the rapid arc? Uh, we use 45 degrees for the collimator rotation, and you know it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a yeah. I'll be honest, I know what the right answer is for the collimator angle. What we did when we uh, implemented this technique is we looked at uh, 15, 30, and 45. Now, 45 gives you um, uh, sort of the, I think, the best ability to optimize dose from a from a treatment planning perspective. However, it also results in the largest field sizes that are required in the X direction, which can limit how far the MLC can travel. So it's sort of bad from 
from that perspective. And what I did to determine that 45 was better um, was, well, <laughs> I don't know better, but what we ended up using was I did plans for several patients with 15, 30, and 45. And when I looked at the monitor units that I got with those plans, they tended to be lower with 45 degrees. And when I played the movie, the fields were open more with 45 degrees. You know how sometimes with Rapid Arc you can see these plans when you play the movie and the MLC is dancing all over the place and you got little little specks of MLC open all over, like scattered around the field? That kind of stuff makes me nervous, especially with respect to lung when there's motion and we know interplay is going on, etc. I, I was more comfortable when field apertures were larger. And I found with a 45 degree collimator, the, the field apertures stayed more contiguous and they were larger than they were with smaller angles. So that's why we used that. But it was not, I mean, we didn't validate that with measurements or anything like that until we came up to that. Okay, um, you always came waiting. Um, you know what, for the most part, yes. In fact, early on, when we were spending a little bit more time tweaking these plans, we we tried things like, oh, increase the weight a little more than 60% in the base field, and, or lower it a little, and we found very little difference in the dose. The only time we really play around with the weighting is when we put those ant and post fields on in the base field, if uh, the core dose bit too high, or if the target is very anterior, we'll sometimes do a 60-40 weighting with 60% 60 60 from the ant field and 40% from the post field for that base field component. But, but we, we've always used 60% um, being delivered base fields with 40% being delivered by the rapid arc. And we had, it was interesting, we had a, a very experienced dosimetrist from uh, the Odette Cancer Center at Sunnybrook, and she came up and she spent some time looking at this technique, and, um, and she spent a couple of days just going through waiting, looking at different scenarios of waiting, and her conclusion at the end of that, independent from us, was that the waiting that we have and that I presented seems to work the best in general. So that was a nice con confirmation of that. Um, heterogeneity, yes, it is always on. Um, it seems some TV volumes are not covered by 100% of the dose. Do you only assess your plans by having the 95% PTV coverage? Uh, yes, we do. I, you know what, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a fan of people evaluating dose CTV. I think it's inappropriate uh, because uh, the whole point of PTV is that on a day-to-day -day basis we know the target will be within the PTV, but we don't know whether the CTV will be in the same position. So I think it's it's um, it's what it what asking for constraints on the CTV drives up the complexity in planning and asks for ob extra objectives on the CTV, which may inadvertently increase the the modulation in the beams, etc. And and I really don't think it's for any clinical benefit because we're not placing the CTV there every day. That's the whole point of of having our our PTV margin. Um, so there, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. That's a little bit of a sore point with me, but I argue about that with my physicians too all the time. Um, now that said, we have I, we, we, our protocol is changing slightly. We are um, we, we were using six and thirty three before uh, with with kind of a ninety five to one hundred five percent tolerance. We are slowly converting our dose over to sixty gray in thirty fractions based on a couple of phase two RTOG studies. And the coverage that, the, actually the way we prescribe our dose is that 95% of our PTV is covered by 100% of the dose. So it's, our plans are, we've lowered the dose per, per fraction, but we've kind of heated up our normalization. So that's, if some of you are probably doing um, those, uh, that style of, of prescription. And I, actually, I quite like it, um, and we're, we're getting on to that. But anyways, I'm getting off topic, sorry. Um, are there with neutron dose to the patient with 18 MV base field? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, anytime we get into uh, you, the use of higher energies that are capable of um, of uh, nuclear energy, we 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 will have that concern, no doubt. 
Um, I think, though, keep in mind that we are doing just open fields, so the monitor units in those base fields are small. I mean, typically uh, 50 to 60 MUs that you would be seeing. Um, I think your, the argument for neutrons is, is more significant if you're going to be modulating your, your fields with IMRT at 18 MV then you're delivering a lot more monitor units so you're, and you're blocking a lot of the field, putting that high atomic number of material in front of the beam. So you're, you have the capability to produce a lot more uh, neutrons in that style of treatment. When you, when you do an open field with 60% uh, with of the bills, it's really no different than the considerations we would have with respect to neutrons for a breast treatment or, uh, or, or a pelvis treatment that was using 18 MV. Uh, so we keep the MUs down, and hence uh, the neutron production should be similar to other uh, disease sites. Uh, how long is the treatment time with a hybrid plan? Uh, typically, the patient treatment slot is 15 minutes. Uh, once they're aligned and cone beamed, it's about uh, around five minutes, four or five minutes of beam time. Uh, actually, probably even less than that. Gee, I wish I had. Yeah, uh, somewhere between three and five minutes. The, the therapists order the field so that we start at the post field, and we deliver the post field, and then we deliver the arc that comes up from the post anteriorly, and then we, while we're while we're almost at zero, then they deliver the ant field, and then they deliver the other arc that comes down the other way. So it it kind of helps speed things up a little. I'm sure they have even more tricks that they use to to get the time in, but. But uh, anyway, it's, it's there. TV is covered by 100% of the dose. So it's, our plans are, we've lowered the dose per, per fraction, but we've kind of heated up our normalization. So that's, if some of you are probably doing um, those, uh, that style of, of prescription. And actually, I quite like it. Um, and we're, we're getting on to that. But anyways, I'm getting off topic, sorry. Um, are there with neutron dose to the patient with 18 MV base fields? Um, yeah, Absolutely. I mean, anytime we get into uh, you, the use of higher energies that are capable of um, of uh, the nuclear energy, we 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 will have that concern, no doubt. Um, I think, though, keep in mind that we are doing just open fields, so the monitor units in those base fields are small. I mean, typically uh, 50 to 60 MUs that you would be seeing. Um, I think your, the argument for neutrons is, is more significant if you're going to be modulating your, your fields with IMRT at 18 MV, then you're delivering a lot more monitor units, so you're, and you're blocking a lot of the field, putting that high atomic number of material in front of the beam, so you're, you have the capability to produce a lot more uh, neutrons in that style of treatment. When you, when you do an open field with uh, with 60% of the bills, it's really no different than the considerations we would have with respect to neutrons for a breast treatment or, uh, or, or a pelvis treatment that was using 18 MV. Uh, so we keep the MUs down and hence uh, the neutron production should be similar to other uh, disease sites. Uh, how long is the treatment time with a hybrid plan? Uh, typically, the patient treatment slot is 15 minutes. Uh, once they're aligned and cone beamed, it's about uh, around five minutes, four or five minutes of beam time. Uh, actually, probably even less than that. Gee, I wish I had, yeah, uh, somewhere between three and five minutes. The, the therapists order the field so that we start at the post field, and we deliver the post field, and then we deliver the arc that comes up from the post anteriorly, and then we, while we're, while we're, almost at zero, then they deliver the ant field, and then they deliver the other arc that comes down the other way. So it, it kind of helps speed things up a little. I'm sure they have even more tricks that they use to, to get the time in, but but uh, anyway, it's, it's there. Uh, anyway, it's, it's there. Uh, 